Yo, 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 what's up, people? My name is Tonachi, and I'm back here in the World of Studies Factory. Alrighty, I hope you're keeping very well. Alrighty, so I finally finished this project, and this in front of you is not it, this is something different. So basically, this new factory that I've just completed, which we'll get to in a second, is the fourth configurable style factory that I've done. And this one in front of you is the first one I've done. And I just wanted to go over the ones that I did previously as well, because they're all very different in the way that they um, are able to configure the production and with a very different kind of functionality. So this one has 12 machines on near the top floor, and behind those 12 machines is basically one mix bell, which allows you to change the, the configuration of each machine and change it on the fly and produce any recipe. But the only bad thing, this, this was pretty inefficient. It's not a good, a good use of resources, but it was my first attempt at a configurable style factory. And I was kind of in two minds to maybe possibly delete it to help on performance of the game. I've ended up kind of using it as the distribution point for various factories and also like a hub uh, for drone ports, again, distributing some goods. And on the top floor, there's like a, a kind of comprehensive storage system so it would have been a pain to delete it it would have been i think a shame to delete it anyways all right so coming over here this is the second configurable factory that i did actually it's the third but anyway let's just say it's the second so this one is a configurable factory using power switches and i did a video on this covering it so down below i've kind of kept the messy and the ugly work in that horrible building and just left it gray to try and blend it into the mountain and the rock face so it doesn't stand out too much and uh, basically all the production is done in here though and the messy work is done down there and it uses power levers and um, as you can see there's a row of power levers in the middle there um, splitters on the wall which you can use to configure the machines and downstairs we have four uh, manufacturers and on the top we have eight assemblers and again another row of power switches this system actually worked out pretty well and i'm thinking about doing this again but on a much bigger scale because this is obviously very small and uh, just like a little test you only call off the resources you need for the production cycle that you're doing the only part i didn't like was having to use truck stations because they take up a lot of space but it did end up working kind of cool nonetheless and anyway that was the second configurable factory that i did well actually the third but um let's just say it's the second all righty i'm moving here to the third configurable factory and um, this one i've covered quite a few times so it's just got just under 500 machines and this one uses a system of uh, splitters on a wall uh, one representing every single item produced by manufacturers assemblers and constructors and it was a much bigger scale with just under 500 machines again it's sufficient in the sense that all of the resources in the base are funneled only to the to the machines that are turned on through the configurable um well through the splitters that are on the wall here and as i said i've pretty much covered this in a few videos you see there's loads of splitters on one wall and each one representing uh, one group of machines Alrighty, so those are the three configurable factories that i've done so far and they all work very differently and this last configurable factory that i've just finished is a uh, very different and unique in the way that it, it kind of goes about in a configurable production and this building in front of us is the first step towards a gathering the resources that I needed for this new project and I've covered this on a video as well and then all of the goods they get onto this train station here and actually we'll catch a train as well since they're here and they head on to the project in the distance so what I've been doing off camera is I'm going through my world and I deleted anything that was kind of unnecessary that was easy to delete and wasn't too difficult to do without causing too many problems I had a little test bench area in the desert I deleted all of that I deleted the uh, remotely accessible storage in the alien uh, structure just there as well um, I also deleted the alien I did a video on like advanced alien technology and if you've caught that I built something underneath the world I've deleted all of that as well um, I've deleted about a hundred lights around the world a fair amount of belt, belts here and there I mean it's made a little bit of an improvement nothing major uh, but it's definitely helped a little bit and I really wanted to get on with this project and actually finish it I did initially think finish it in update 5 just in case they did anything new but I thought you know what screw it I can just do something new in update 5 start a new project or maybe even a new world well, I do really actually want to keep this world going I kind of you kind of get attached to the bases you built and the world you built it'd be really nice if maybe they made some gameplay improvements and performance improvements so I can keep this world but more than likely it wouldn't happen I'd have to probably delete a lot more anyway so i've finally finished this build so this factory ended up being 1022 machines so it's a huge project and i did actually scale it back to what i originally had in mind and what i wanted to do was have one programmable splitter that would control the production of every single machine in the building but it would have ended up just being too much belt work too many splitters and conveyors and as i mentioned considering the performance of my game i thought it was a good idea maybe to scale it back and just done it for high-end tier items only now saying that it still produces every single item in 
in the game. But the, on the controllable side, on the configurable side, it's only for high-end items. And I've chosen 15 of the hardest top items in the game to produce. And those can be done in a configurable style through one programmable splitter. But we'll get to that in a second. All right, so I won't cover this too much as I did it on the last video. Um, so we have the aluminium production on the left there. And on the right, we have the iron um, production here. And on the top floor, we have the copper. Oh, and thank you to Mr. Fairing. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but thank you, mate. I really appreciate the advice you gave. So basically, it was the issue of me connecting these refineries to a light control panel. And basically one of those unintentionally i didn't mean to do it but there was a lot of wires and i kind of got confused which one was which so basically that was causing the issue of the lights flickering and the refineries kept turning on and off but anyway mate much appreciated thank you for the the heads up on that that was very cool indeed all right so we have aluminium we have the iron and copper on the right down here in the basement we have the production of the minerals on this side we have the quartz doing the silica and the crystals going back on the opposite side we have the machines doing the uh, the concrete all of the output heads out there and then coming back to this section we have the roof of the smelters and the foundries doing the caterium and the steel and on this side we have the plastic and rubber and upstairs we have the refineries doing the petroleum coke all of that was covered in the last video so i'm not going to spend any time on that but i've done a lot more since then and there's a lot more different compartments and sections now to the build it's a little bit of a maze actually there's about eight nine ten different factories like small factories within this one large factory um so we've added a lot of different sections and a lot of corridors going everywhere as i said i kind of get lost myself uh, sometimes and uh, on this floor we have refineries that are producing uh, the heavy oil residue and the fuel which is going on to do turbo fuel uh, in the middle section and the byproduct which is called the polymer resin makes some more rubber and we'll get to that section later and coming over here we have another section doing with more refineries doing more fuel and this time these refineries are producing fuel for 40 fuel generators at the front of the factory so we're producing six is it six or eight uh six or eight for eight six thousand and megawatts of power in this uh well actually we're producing more because there's, there's more than refineries here but in this section we're producing with these 10 or 11 refineries fuel for these 40 fuel generators on this side i was thinking to do turbo fuel for this instead you either with refineries or with blenders but there's a lot going on here and i want to try and minimize it so i've just ended up using normal fuel Actually, I'll come back to that section a little bit later because that's pretty crucial uh, to the system in the middle. All right, so let's head back now to the other section and continue through to the middle part of the factory. And if we go down here, we come down here past the aluminium, come back to this section in the middle and we'll call all the way across in the central corridor. And this will lead us to the, the central like, bus system. So this side of the factory on the front is basically doing everything relating uh, to ores and fluids, most mostly anyway, a few exceptions, and it's turning all of the ores into basically ingots and the the oil and the water, plastic and rubber, uh, and fuel and stuff like that. And it heads onto this middle kind of central bus system, which looks like it kind of reminds me of like a huge um, train station kind of. So basically, it's a long corridor from the front of the factory over there leading all the way to the other side of the factory where we've got roughly 750 machines uh, the real bulk of the production and all of these resources head on over there with the fluids which are just above us most of them and because it's a long way i've basically done four ways to get across we can take those hyper tubes we can take the conveyor belt although my favorite is um the the zip line and it lets you enjoy the the view all the way there And you can just chill out and take in a, a good look of all the stuff moving along with you. And this will take you all the way across with the pipes just above us. And the ingots, the plastic and the rubber, the minerals, a little bit of sulfur, all coming along with us here. And this will lead us to the uh, the last section of the, of the building. And I think it's this one. And there's lots of exposed windows throughout the building. So you can get a good look of stuff moving through the factory. But this will basically take us to the real uh, the hub of the production where all the machines are and I haven't done too much in terms of decoration here as a, I just want to keep it a production area so we have on the ground floor roughly 300 no 400 hold on yeah just under 400 uh, constructors here are producing pretty much everything that a constructor can produce and they'll only start producing once the item they are producing is called off by other machines upstairs otherwise they'll just lay dormant and all of the stuff kind of joins uh, a, a huge bus system on the right side or on the left side over there they're doing bus systems like this i found personally is like the easiest way to kind of like logistically manage 
uh, the kind of logistical nightmare when you're trying to configure so many different types of production groups. And so basically the, at the output of all of these um, constructors joins this conveyor system. However, their input from the ingots was from the other side. The good thing is what that allows to do is each row of these constructors is producing one item. And if I want to change it, I just change the recipe on the constructors and I can just choose the different ingot that I want and then just uh, connect it with a, a conveyor belt. So it allows me to change the, the recipes if I want to balance things differently uh, quite easily. And if we go up a floor, we have another roughly 300 assemblers again producing pretty much every item that assemblers can produce and the same thing these will only start producing once the items they they make are are called off by the manufacturers and blenders up above and again as before you have uh, the bus system on the right where all the assemblers call off exactly which items they need from the right or they actually the items they're producing are joining uh, in this case the the bus system on the right and on the other side uh, the bus system is basically for the, the output of the constructors and the bus system on that side is the output for the assemblers uh, kind of I mean there's a few variations but loosely that's what that's what's going on and you can see the output there and then coming up to the top floor we have uh, 96 manufacturers and uh, blenders again calling off all the items they need from either side some of the items they need are from one side and then some of the items they need will be from the other side. Oh, righty, so that's basically the production area. It's a huge bloody mess, basically. Lots of machines. Where am I going? Over here. Okay, now let's head to the main part in the center area where the real interesting stuff happens. Okay, so that hypertube leads us back to this uh, central kind of transit area. And if we take this hypertube and it leads us to this central area where we have basically with this programmable splitter we control or well, basically every, everything in the whole factory uh, it kind of it starts and stop and it's controlled from this one programmable splitter and in the middle here we have a storage for the output for the the manufacturers and another one to decide what goes into a sink or what goes into storage uh, here we can turn on the um the particle accelerators to make nuclear pasta and those are for the lights Alrighty, so as i mentioned i kind of scaled back this idea and because I scaled back the idea, as I was going to do basically to control every item in game from one programmable splitter. But because I've already done it for high end tier items, it gave me this huge open center area to be a little bit more creative and to, to mess around with a different idea here and try something a little bit different. So basically the front section there is where we have the nine, 10 different sections producing stuff from the ores. And behind that all there, we have the 750 machines. And it left me this huge center area as you can see, uh, lots of space to be a little bit creative, as I said, and uh, do this new idea. All right, so this idea is completely different from the other configurable factories that I've done before. And I'll try to explain more briefly what's happening. In the center area here, from the programmable splitter on this side, uh, when we choose an item from this output, and these are the items that we can control, basically these are the items that we can turn on and off through this programmable splitter and these are the, basically the 15 most high-end tier items in the game when we choose one of these items or multiple items or for example if we turn on thermal propulsion rockets that will automatically also turn on turbo motors and, uh, and they also need modular frames which in consequence will also turn on heavy modular frames because those need um, uh, the fuse modular frames need heavy modular frames we're also going to need radio control units because turbo motors need control units which also need oscillators so just by turning on thermal propulsion rockets Rockets, uh, different cycles in within the group which are needed to produce that will automatically turn on as well or we can just turn on one of these items individually and basically all these items on the side all these machines uh, represent one of those production groups so we have 15 groups of uh, manufacturers and all the output heads to this middle section so basically these machines are kind of placeholders they're not actually producing the item they kind of represent if that makes sense however the output that they represent comes through on this belt so for example this manufacturer i think represents supercomputers so, so when we turn on supercomputers this will turn on these lights will turn on and we'll get to that in a second at the bottom and then all the supercomputers that are produced by the 750 machines in that section 
will come out here. In a way, what it does, it kind of gives the impression that this machine is producing all of the supercomputers. And down below, what we have here, this is the system that makes it kind of unique and a little bit different, well, very different from what I've done before. And we have 56 fuel generators and 14 blenders, half on one side and another half on the other side. So when we turn on one of the items from the program, we will split to in the middle. It will go to the front of the base. It goes through a system that basically will call off and interrupt uh, petroleum coke to come to one of these uh, blenders to make turbo fuel. Now they've already got all the sulfur and they've already got all of the fuel and the um, turbo uh, heavy oil residue. So the only thing they're lacking is petroleum coke. But as I said, when we turn on the splitter in the middle, it will go to a system where it interrupts petroleum coke to send it to the relevant blender, which will then turn on the four fuel generators that are linked to one of these blenders. All right, you with me so far? No, maybe? Anyway, let's continue. When we turn on these four fuel generators by one of these blenders, these four fuel generators will then go on with loads of cabling on the side, loads of wires, and head on to the manufacturers that they represent and turn them on. But there was a problem with that because one fuel generator produces 150 uh, megawatts of power and that is enough for two manufacturers which want at 55 megawatts require 55 megawatts so two manufacturers is 110 megawatts uh, so i can play around with a little bit of overclocking i haven't in most cases so basically um, one fuel generator powers two manufacturers or two blenders which need 75 megawatts now unfortunately i couldn't link all four fuel generators together because when one of these um these blenders turns on at the beginning the turbo fuel just trickles in and then one machine will turn on it might turn on or off a few times until it really kicks in and the the, the pipes saturate with a uh, turbo fuel and then so the machines don't turn on all simultaneously at once they turn on, on in different stages and if you link the uh, all the output together what would happen uh, for example if i connected 10 manufacturers which would need 550 megawatts these produce 600 accumulatively if we connected all them together the output if only one machine turned on connecting to 10 manufacturers the the fuse will trip so that would keep happening so i had to basically separate the output of each fuel generator uh, independently to feed only two machines does that make sense no great let's continue but anyway i don't want to spend too long on that just to keep it short they turn on the machines in the machine room once the manufacturers and blenders start calling off items that will basically trigger the constructors and the assemblers to start producing. So in that sense, it's very efficient and all the resources only get funneled to the machines that are turned on. All right, so I think the best way is for me to shut up now. And uh, I do like these uh, enlarged um, gate walls. I think they look really cool. And I just realized now that the only factory that I can really see from here is the other large configurable factory. I don't know why, but these uh, gate walls, they're kind of nicely framed like a portrait. Uh, the very nice looking scenery in the background there. I like it. I like it a lot. Nice. Okay, so I think the best thing is for me to show up now and show an example of how this works by turning things on. It's usually always the best way. So let's start from the easier stuff, which is like heavy modular frames and crystal oscillators. So let's uh, do those first, heavy modular frames and then crystal and oscillators. Okay, we can follow the process as it goes. So basically there, um, there's crystal oscillators and heavy modular frames and every item there going for a loop uh, way underneath here at the bottom there just going up and down up and down round and round and they they pass through this splitter and when they're called off from here they're redirected then to another conveyor which will take them uh over to this section okay so they'll start coming through here there you go you can start seeing some heavy modular frames and crystal oscillators uh, they'll start heading through and they'll be called off by one of these programmable splitters so they go right to the end and then back up, come all the way back to the beginning again, and then go up. So there's three different levels. It's kind of like 14 different staggering interrupting systems that represent the 14 different groups of machines. All right, so basically, as I said, they'll come down here and one of these programmable splitters will call them off. So now I'm just looking for the one that is going to call off a heavy modular frames or crystal oscillators. I can't remember which is which, to be honest. It's, uh, but it's, it's not the last one. The last one is um, thermal propulsion. I remember that one. It must be one of these, so we're getting close to the end. Oh no, it's not that one either. Hold on. No, yeah, here we go. So this one is calling off the crystal oscillators. And so they'll come onto here and then join this little loop here. Basically, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail. Just um, I kind of covered it on a video that I did called Experimenting with Different Alternative Ideas to Control Belts. I've kind of covered this system on there. This is basically the same thing, kind of kind of a little bit different, a few modifications, but 14 different times uh, on three different levels. So they'll just enter a loop and every time 
this uh, oscillator goes back onto that merger, it will cause uh, a, one of these, um, what they call petroleum coke, to then overflow. And one of these belts here, there's 14 of these belts, again representing uh, the 14 different items, excluding the nuclear pasta on the, uh, what they called the, um, I can't really say it, SA particle accelerators because they're controlled by a power switch because they use too much power, obviously. Four fuel generators can't power uh, two particle accelerators that I'm using, or even one actually. So the fuel generators, the, or the turbo, the blenders that are making the turbo fuel for the fuel generators, they only need 10 petroleum coke per minute. This is a Mark 1 conveyor. So this will send through 60, but there have been 30s going back that way and 30s going that way. Then I've got another room over there with loads of splitters and mergers again, which will again separate it again three times to give me exactly 10 petroleum coke per minute heading to each one of the, um, the blenders that are making the turbo fuel for the fuel generators. Like, yeah, that's a mouthful. When I first started building this, I thought this room would be plenty of space, but um, a little snug little fit. Right, anyway, so that's what's happening with the heavy modular frame frames and the crystal oscillators they're going to their one of the respective 14 interrupting systems which will then cause petroleum coke to overflow 30 items per minute here and then behind this wall it's uh, brought down to 10 items per minute which will then head on to one of these blenders which this must be one of them which needs 9.99 petroleum coke per minute 10 basically and then this will turn on these four fuel generators which will turn on the light any consequence that what it will do is it will turn on the relevant machine upstairs on the top level so that one is doing for crystal oscillators or heavy modular frames i'm not sure which is which as you can see at the beginning they, they turn on and off because what was happening here is the fuel generators and the, all the pipe that's filling up with turbo fuel it takes about two three four minutes to properly fill all the pipes and then once the pipes are properly full the, the generators stay on permanently properly and then obviously the machines and the lights stay on and i just put lights above the machine so you can clearly see from a distance exactly which machines are on and um, the only thing is it's not very clear which machine is producing which except from the output of the belt underneath each section has one belt except this section because the nuclear pasta coming from there will come out of this belt and the nuclear pasta that will come out of that accelerator will come out of that belt now this system does take two three four minutes to actually properly kick in because there's so much that needs to happen first uh before that the machines can actually turn on call off item has to come through this programmable splitter go all the way down there head all the way down there to the petroleum coke interrupting system and then the petroleum coke has to come all the way back to one of these groups of blenders and um fuel generators and obviously the, the fuel has to fill up the pipes have to fill up and then obviously the uh, once all that happens the machines have to kick in and then they have to fill up as well so it does take about anything from two to five maybe even ten minutes calling off thermal propulsion which calls off like seven eight different of these groups that can take up like to five ten minutes to really kick in uh, these ones about three four minutes because they don't rely on anything else i mean heavy modular frames only use these items produced by constructors and uh, assemblers that one has started coming through already um, the only problem is also is um most of the heavy modular frames will go to fill the belts that fill um, the blenders that are making the fuse modular frames because they need heavy modular frames. So until all of that pipe uh, conveyor work is saturated, uh, only a few of the modular frames will come through, which will lead them to that central container here. Although on this bit, I have to choose first uh, which items I want to come through to the container. If I don't choose anything there, they'll just all, all go into a, uh, a sink. So from this programmable splitter, I can choose which items go to a sink or which go items come into this uh, storage container there like for example if i'm producing thermal propulsion um, as i mentioned they turn on so many other machines and i might not want all of the output from the other machines um, so i can just choose to fill up the container with only thermal propulsion units for example i'm not sure if that makes sense but anyway already so i've had the machines running there for a few minutes and some of the crystal oscillators are coming through now so that means they must have uh, saturated the belts that are filling the radio control units so we've got some of those coming through there and you can see some of the heavy modular frames now starting to come through on that belt and then all of these will head uh, to to this area that I've called the pit. I'm not sure why I've done this, but uh, basically uh, they come around in this circle and they just go around in a circle basically and back that and then back into this central column area uh, where they go into this container. As long as I've got them not to be redirected into a sink uh, through this program, but I've got them any undefined. So they'll all come through uh, into this container and then they'll keep filling up obviously. And once that's filled up, they'll eventually go into the sink after that. All right, so I think that's pretty clear now uh, how that works. So let's give this a real test now and turn all that rubbish off, put on the big boy and Itself, thermal propulsion. Actually, you know what's pretty hard to produce as well is those pressure cubes. Surprisingly, for items produced by assemblers, those in assembly director systems, they're pretty um, involving to produce them. So we've still got those uh, heavy modular frames and oscillators being produced. 
and it would take them roughly about the same three four minutes to actually turn off until basically all of the pipe um, having the, the turbo fuel they empty out into the fuel generators and the fuel generators burn through all of that so now you've got the pressure conversion cubes I'm not sure you can see those very easily there you go you can just see them now um, so we need a lot more of these to come through because these have to turn on about three or four different uh, groups of machines. Uh, this one here, which is um, heavy modular frames. Actually, we could just check from the output as they go through. Here. And this one here, they're turning on, which is the radio control unit. And they're coming through to this one as well, which is the actual assembler. And they're turning on this one as well, which is the fuse modular frames. So that was turn on the blenders. Well, send the petroleum coat to the blender to turn on the generators to turn on the blenders making the, the fused uh, modular frames and um, I think that's all of them oh and one more here as well okay and the crystal oscillators to make the radio control units okay so even pressure conversion cubes are going to turn on five different groups of machines was that five or six can't remember five or six anyway all right so now we can come and turn on uh, this one which, which will turn on the two particle accelerators and I think they've already got stuff inside them so it looks like they've already turned on already yeah so from this kind of central observation and control area you can clearly see from all the lights exactly which groups of machines and blenders and generators are turned on and you can see that that's the blenders turned on that's making the fuse modular frames it just turned off but as I mentioned until the all of the uh, the pipe work fills up with uh, turbo fuel but, and for the first minute or so they kind of turn on and off a few times but already we've got the fuse modular frames coming through as well which this belt represents the stuff that's coming out of that blender there and if we cycle around we can here we go we can see the nuclear pasta that's coming out from that particle accelerator and then we've got another one over there, obviously coming from that particle accelerator. And all the items kind of cycle around this uh, little pit area just to give you a little bit of feedback of exactly what's being produced. And there's the pasta going through. Finally, what I'm going to do now is turn this off and produce thermal propulsion, the last item, and we'll turn that off. All right, so while that's happening, uh, some of you might be thinking, well, Archie, this is really over the top, complicated, unnecessary way to produce items. And you know what? You're totally right. Uh, what kind of really interests me is these alternative production ideas. Um, I like the kind of interactive production with some kind of visual feedback of what's happening. And that's more kind of my thing, this kind of alternative and uh, configurable style production. I mean, I do do normal uh, production factories as well. So it's not like I don't do that kind of stuff as well. But this is more my kind of thing. But as I mentioned, it's not an efficient uh, use of a lot of resources. It's not particularly easy pretty over the top and unnecessary I need to be challenged a little bit and to do something a little bit different and uh, I just find that these alternative production ideas and to try and make the whole process a little bit more interactive and uh, alternative is what I personally enjoy everyone's got their own thing and it's all great there's nothing wrong you, you do whatever you enjoy it's about doing what you find enjoyable and what, what gives you a challenge and what you're comfortable with at the end of the day all right so I've had this running for about five minutes now and it looks like all the machines have turned on here we've got the turbo motors coming out there as well Those that's the frames not sure what that one is that one's a radio control unit there we've got the fuse modular frames and there we've got some of those turbo motors and oh no, sorry thermal propulsion uh, rocket thingy majiggies and there we've got some cooling systems and um what else? oh those are off okay cool and i've set this splitter here to only put the thermal propulsion into the storage and the rest of the items that are going around are coming into the uh, the central pillar area they'll all go off into a sink except as i said the thermal propulsion which will uh, come into this and what i kind of like is that this central observation area and control area you get a good view of exactly what's happening around the base pretty much all the interesting things that are happening anyway and uh, you can clearly see and you've got a nice backdrop as well with the huge gate walls and we can clearly see all everything that's coming through into the center and uh, just it gives you good visual feedback as well um, of like, what, that's what's moving through the factory as I said this makes the whole process a little bit more interactive and a little bit more visual feedback actually that reminded me ironically the limiting factor of how many thermal propulsion units I could produce was actually was due to these uh, fuel generators uh, as I mentioned one of, uh, one set of fuel generators four of them uh, produces 600 megawatts which is enough for 10 manufacturers and ironically the modular frames needed um, by the thermal propulsion so these modular engines you can only produce one modular engine per manufacturer manufacturer one per minute basically and thermal propulsion rockets need two and a half per minute to produce only one uh, rocket and because I'm limited to only 10 um, machines 
her group of uh, blenders and, and what they call fuel generators, I could only produce, um, what's it called, 10 modular engines per minute, which limits me to only four, uh, what's it called, thermal propulsion rockets per minute, which is a shame because this factory actually has enough resources to produce somewhere around eight to 10, maybe 12 uh, per minute uh, thermal propulsion rockets. So I was actually ironically limited because of this system. Now I could have worked around it and added more generators, overclocked a few generators and the blenders. I just thought it's not worth it. I'm not really that bothered about how many items I'm producing anymore. Uh, for me, it's all about the idea and the principle. So I just left it as it is. I'm not too bothered about that, to be honest. All right, so another project is complete and I'm pretty happy with the way it's turned out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to upload this world as I'm not sure I'm going to do too much more until update five. So if you're interested, you can check out the, the recent stuff that I've built. So that would include that factory. And of course you can come and check out the two alien builds that I did recently as well. Well, I was saying that I've remo removed, as I said, the uh, remotely accessible storage from that floor. So there's not actually much happening in there. It's stuff you can check out, I guess, inside that nuclear alien factory. And of course the, the mega extractor as well. Anyway, as I said, I'll upload this save game file. Um, I do want to do a couple more things to this. I want to add a drone pool and it needs a little bit of balancing. Everything needs a little bit of balancing, but considering actually off the bat, it's working pretty well, which I'm surprised. Um, if the save game file in the, is not in the description, when I post the video up, I'll put it up maybe a day or two later, but I'll try and put it up at the same time as I put the video up. But anyway, guys, another project is complete. I'm happy with the way it's turned out. I hope you enjoyed the little tour. Have a great weekend or week whenever you watch the video and maybe I'll catch you again soon.